Tonight, we're learning more details about the grisly murders in Idaho. You can see they're right behind me, those sliding glass doors. Authorities say that's how they believe the suspect left the home. Welcome back. My name is Annie Elise. state one typically associates with horrific crimes. Nevertheless, at the end of 2022, around Thanksgiving time, a massive case took the U.S. by storm when a group of college kids were murdered in the town of Moscow, Idaho. The mark of extreme brutality left on the crime scene quickly became one of many haunting signatures of this case. I'm Mr. Black, and I'm here with Annie Elise from the channel Tend to Life. This is the disturbing truth about what happened to four friends on the other side of a sliding glass door in Idaho. Guys, I met Charlie D'Amelio, check! <laughs> Kaylee Gonzalez was 21 years old and a senior at the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho. Moscow is a hip college town nestled in the heart of Idaho's scenic mountains. Kaylee was studying general studies and was also a member of the Alpha Phi sorority. She was the ultimate go-getter and dedicated, outspoken, motivated, and full of life. Kaylee had recently moved out of a house on 1122 King Road and was set to graduate in early December 2022. After graduation, Kaylee was planning on moving to Austin, Texas for a job in the tech industry. Kaylee had just purchased a Range Rover and she was so excited for what her life had in store. She was also very excited by this new car purchase of hers and she wanted to show her best friend, Madison Mogan, back in Moscow, Idaho. So she drove back for the weekend to show her best friend her new car and party one final time before her move to Texas. I thought maybe I should have put her in some gun safety courses, have done something, but she had her phone right next to her and she couldn't call 911. Put the finger in the trigger. You always put your hand here. Okay. And then when you're ready to shoot, you go here and you just use your tip. Okay, okay, okay. And then you go softly. But this arm always has to be strong. And this one, right there to brace it. So aiming, you know what aiming is? Yeah, it's right between those two things. Those two things, so like aim at a star. Yeah. Put that and that red little orange tip at the star and you'll shoot it. Okay, but dad, I'm gonna, oops. My thing's on the trigger. Okay, pull okay, it. Get ready. Are you ready? Yep. Plug twice. my ears or something. Here, I'll plug yours. Okay, okay, wait. Yeah, you hit it twice. Boom, boom. Ah! Again, again. Oh. It got plugged again. No, that was the last bullet. Oh, was it? She screamed when he shot that. Madison Mogan, also known as Maddie, was also 21 years old and a senior at the University of Idaho. Maddie was a marketing major and a member of Pi Beta Phi sorority. Kaylee and Maddie were practically sisters. They grew up together, did everything together, and Kaylee's family said that they were each other's chosen family. Do you think anyone would drink wine? I like, I'll have some wine. I didn't even think of it, really, because, you know, I'm not a big drinker, yeah, but maybe I should have something. You don't, you're not a big drinker? Good night. That's fine. I'm not about to keep barking at a bitch who ain't about to do that. <laughs> anyway, just mad because you was a stripper that thought you was going to get wife and didn't, psych. That's fine. I'll be a stripper because I make way more money than you, bitch. Maddie was still living in that shared King Road house, a house right by campus and all of the sorority and fraternity houses with their other good friend, Zana Kernodal. <laughs> I'm gonna 
I'm so my bad. Do you want naughty or something? Oh no, that's okay. Hey, my chat kind got it when I was blocked out. Alright, you like want to watch a movie or something? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, that's dope. But I don't have a TV or anything like that. Oh. So, I, we can just like watch ESPN on my phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's Ronaldo. He's number seven. Alright, so do you want to listen to my favorite song? I don't really show a lot of people. Yeah, but yeah, no, that's cool. Ten Underground. Oh, that sounds fun. I'm the boys this. get wrecked for this shit. Wow. Um, maybe I Shit, can... sorry, that was my mom. Um, so you tried to stay in there? Um, I opened the door! Where are you answering my phone call? What is that? Dude, you gotta get out of here. I got a bitch in here. Xana was just 20 years old and a junior. Like Maddie, she was studying marketing and in the same sorority as her, Pi Beta Phi. Ethan Chapin was also 20 years old, and he attended the same school as the girls. He was a member of the Sigma Chi fraternity. He was majoring in recreation, sport, and tourism management. Ethan was a triplet, and both of his siblings also attended the University of Idaho. Oh, there. Oh. Wait, Barry, I can't see you. Ten years old today. Dad and I thought we'd never see double digits. Dad, where, are you, where going? are you going? Oh, didn't we tell you for your birthday? Dudes, we're flying to Disneyland right now. Happy birthday! We're hopping on an airplane. We're going to Disneyland. We're going to Disneyland. True story. We're flying you to Disneyland right now. No. Yes, we are! Yes, we, are. we really are. We are going to school. No. You're not going to school for the whole week. Then what about all our stuff? Mm. All four of these college students were very good friends with each other and hung out often. As cliche as it sounds, they were truly all well-rounded, all-American kids. They had tons of friends in the sorority and fraternity Greek life community and were extremely well-liked by everyone who came into contact with them. Now, Ethan didn't live with the girls in that King Road residence, but he stayed at the girls' house often, which was again just off campus, and he stayed with them on Saturday, November 12th, 2022, with his girlfriend, Zanna. On that Saturday, November 12th, since Kaylee and Maddie were both 21, they opted to go to the bars, and Zana and Ethan went to a house party near campus at the Sigma Chi house, which although the map says is an 11 minute walk from the King Road residence, you can cut through and go directly to the house much faster by foot. The bar that Kaylee and Maddie went to was called the Corner Club, and it was about a mile from their home on King Road. But what started as a carefree, typical night for these four college kids with fun drinking and partying and just having a good time ended in a gruesome bloodbath, something that would completely rock this otherwise sleepy college town and the community forever. On Sunday, November 13th, 2022, police received a call around 11.58 a.m from a caller reporting that they believed that somebody was unconscious on King Road at the residence, right by the university's golf course, which is adjacent to Greek Row. When the police arrived early Sunday afternoon, they had no idea that they were about to discover one of the most grisly and heinous crime scenes to ever take place in this tight-knit college town of Moscow, Idaho. At 5.07 p.m. later that afternoon, the university sent out an alert requesting that all students shelter in place. The sheltering request was lifted approximately 40 minutes later after investigators with Moscow Police Department told the school that they did not believe that there was an active threat to the students' safety. But nobody knew why this alert was sent out, what was going on. However, rumors of a massacre happening at the King Road residence were quickly swirling around campus and jumping from phone to phone, text message to text message, to where everybody heard that something was unraveling, but nobody knew what had happened exactly. Was there an OD? Did somebody get in a fight? Was there an altercation? But the truth of what took place inside that home 
was nothing that anybody could have ever imagined. Shortly after the alert was lifted, the University of Idaho's president, Scott Green, released a campus-wide announcement. This announcement said, It is with deep sadness that I share with you today that the university was notified today of the death of four University of Idaho students living off campus, believed to be victims of homicide. We are grateful for the support of the community and the ongoing efforts of the police department. The university is committed to supporting students and families during this difficult time. After the announcement was made, classes were canceled that following Monday, and students and parents were extremely freaked out by the news. The majority of students decided to head home for Thanksgiving break early. This kind of thing just didn't happen in Moscow. Nothing like this had ever taken place in the university's history. Now at this point, the only information released was that four students were deceased inside the girls' shared house. No cause of death or identities had yet been released. The police department said there was not an outstanding threat to other students' safety, hence why that shelter in place was lifted just 40 minutes after the alert went out. However, nobody was in custody for this crime. So many people were questioning how there could be no continued threat to the public if there were no details provided and nobody was in custody. Four students had just been killed and it was a homicide right by campus, but there wasn't an ongoing threat somehow? Good afternoon. My name is Roger Lanier. I'm a captain over the operations division for the Moscow Police Department. My last name is spelled L-A-N-I-E-R. Uh, I just want to first state that this tragic murder has shaken the community. It's been very hard for members of the community and it's been equally difficult for our officers and for the investigators. We will continue to put all of our resources towards investigating and bringing this to a resolution. Here's what we've determined so far. On the evening of November 12th, Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Morgan were at a local bar and were later at a food truck in downtown Moscow. This video was from a live social media stream on the platform Twitch, and it records a food truck called the Grub Truck as it fills orders for late night snackers after they leave the bars. This video shows the pair of girls stumbling towards the food truck, ordering a plate of pasta, and then waiting for the food. The girls appeared to walk towards the truck from the other side of the street at approximately 1.33 a.m. They were joined by a young man later identified as Jack Showalter. Jack hung back as Kaylee ordered the food and then waited with the girls until they received the order. Cool, thank you. Absolutely. How many more do you need? Uh, That's the second one? Awesome. Don's mom. Oh wait, yeah, one more, one more. Maybe here. I didn't have a food. It's right here. Um, and then what was the mac? Uh, don't forget to remove the, the spoon. Carbonara. The carbonara. Mac of the week. Here, I'll grab it for Excellent. you. Excellent. And then click see rewards. Enjoy. And it looks like you do not quite have enough points yet. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. I do have a baked burrito pork here for you. Cool, thank you. thank you very much. Where's the pen go, guys? Where's my pen? How are you guys doing? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Too prepared, Derek. Uh, it's because I try not to lose my wallet. It's a good reason. That's smart, Derek. It's probably good to not lose your wallet. At 1.53 a.m., the girls walk away in one direction, leaving Jack speaking with others at the truck. He looked in their direction, surprised that they had walked off, but then is seen walking around the corner in a different direction of them. Then the girls used a private party for a ride home through their campus safety ride service, and they arrived home to the King Road residence at approximately 1.56 a.m. Ethan Chapin and Zana Kernodal 
We're at the Sigma Chi house before also arriving home at approximately 1.45 a.m. Two surviving roommates were also out in the community and they returned home at approximately 1 a.m. and did not wake up until later that morning. On the morning of November 13th at 11.58 a.m., a 911 call was placed to the Wickham Dispatch Center reporting an unconscious person. The call originated from inside the residence and was made from the phone of one of the surviving roommates. Moscow Police Department officers responded and located four victims, two on the second floor and two on the third floor. The Latah County coroners conducted autopsies and detectives have been provided with the results of those autopsies. We know that the autopsies confirmed the identity of the four victims, determined the cause and manner of death as homicide by stabbing. Some of the victims had defensive wounds and each victim was stabbed multiple times. There was no sign of sexual assault. I want to address several areas of speculation, conjecture, and uh, misinformation that has circulated on uh, social media platforms and otherwise. We do not believe the following individuals are involved in this crime. The two surviving roommates, a male seen at the grub truck food vendor downtown, specifically wearing a white hoodie a private party who provided uh, rides home to Kaylee and Madison in the early morning hour of November 13th. Additionally, the identity of the 911 caller and the 911 call have not been released, so any information out there is speculation about that. Investigators are aware that multiple phone calls from Madison and Kaylee's phone were made to a male subject. Any online reports stating that the victims had been tied and gagged are not accurate. Detectives seized the contents of three dumpsters on King Road and searched those dumpsters in an effort to find additional evidence, but nothing of note was discovered. Early in the investigation, local businesses were canvassed in an effort to see if any fixed blade type knives may have recently been purchased. And currently, there are no suspects in custody and we have not located a weapon. The murders of Ethan, Zanna, Madison, and Kaylee are a tragic loss to all of us. Nothing we can do will bring back these young lives. But we have an absolute commitment to working together to solve these senseless murders. God, it smells like dirty dick in here. Murphy, you've been a bad boy. <laughs> oh my god, it's 9-10. Guys, can anybody drop me a class and f***ing leave from my meeting? I was supposed to be there 10 minutes ago. Did anybody do their chores today? Okay, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> My vape was found, so we gotta go get it. <laughs> if you knew Santa, you knew what a light she was to everybody she came across. She was just such a positive influence on everybody around her. I, I honestly, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm her mother and biased, it's just the truth. There's nothing negative you could say about her. She was just such a good soul. She cared. She deeply cared.
cared about her friends and her family. And she just she would never hurt anybody. I don't understand who would want to do anything to any of these kids. They were all great, great kids. The police initially said that the students likely died between 3 and 4 a.m., but that they weren't discovered until several hours later. At first, many students had wondered if this was some kind of situation in which one of the students murdered the others and then took their own life, or possibly a drug overdose, maybe bad drugs, nobody knew. Even the victim's families didn't know. Xana's sister Jasmine spoke to the media and said that they had no idea. All they were told was that it was a homicide. Moscow Police Captain Anthony Dallinger declined to say whether he would describe the death as violent, but reaffirmed that each of the deceased students was considered a victim. None of the four students was believed responsible for the deaths either, and he said, All I can say is that the deaths are ruled a homicide at this point, and homicide and murder are synonymous. We certainly have a crime here, so we are looking for a suspect. The music playing at this part was hit by copyright claim on YouTube so we removed it and re-uploaded the video to avoid issues. The next day the police released more information. They told the public that it was an extremely bloody scene. Crime scene photos showed blood dripping from a bedroom on the first floor down an exterior wall at the back of the house. Ethan was reportedly discovered on the floor, on the second level of this three-story home, suspected to be where this blood was located. Still, the police didn't have a murder weapon, but they believed that the four students were targeted and now believed that their deaths were inflicted by some type of a weapon with a serrated edge, such as a K-bar knife. K-bar knives are military-grade weapons that were originally designed for use by American troops in World War II. Today, they are generally used by outdoorsmen or hunters. The families of Zanna, Ethan, Maddie, and Kaylee were horrified and devastated by this news. Kaylee's family described these kids, saying they were smart, they were vigilant, they were careful, yet all of this still happened. Nobody is in custody, and that means that nobody is safe saying that yes, we are all heartbroken and yes, we are all grasping, but more strong than any of these feelings is anger. We are angry and you should be angry and whoever is responsible, we will find you. We will never stop. The pain you caused has fueled our hatred and sealed your fate. Justice will be served. The statement continues to say they would never stop fighting for us and demanding the truth and justice and neither will we. Joining me now on set, the parents of Kaylee Gonzalez, Christy and Steve Gonzalez. Thank y'all so much for being with me. Um, you guys have been so transparent and strong for the public. Christy, you called the person that did this the boogeyman. Yeah. What did you mean by that? It's literally like what nightmares are made of. Like when you're a little kid and you think of the boogeyman, that's just how I feel. Like, that's just the horrific details of everything. Them just having a good time going home and going to bed and this happening to them. Your best friend crawling into bed. Just crawling every, in bed. Every and girl the boogeyman in America comes. knows what that's the like. The boogeyman doesn't, you know, meet, meet you at McDonald's. I mean, the boogeyman comes and snatches you out of your bedroom. At this point, the police still didn't have anybody in custody and no suspects yet. Yet four young adults were killed in this horrific crime scene. Were they sleeping during the attack? Was this a burglary gone wrong? Nobody knew. Was this a lone killer or more than one person? It's hard to imagine how the four students could be overcome by just one person. Also, the houses were very close together in this area. Did anybody hear anything? Well, according to neighbors, no. So was the killer close to the victims or was this a crime of passion? Hmm, a house like the one these kids lived in is bound to see a lot of foot traffic, parties, music, angry neighbors. It all comes with the territory in those college years. But that house wasn't the only party house in the area. And the night of the murders wasn't the first time the cops were called out to 1112 King Road, albeit for much less concerning reasons. We better take a look anyway, just to see if anything stands out. 
that's the first. We don't want to pay that. Next time, we'll definitely check. The later at night it gets, the more expensive it gets. Okay. So spend the money on beer instead, not on tickets. Keep the music down. Have a good party. Make sure everyone's over 21. Yeah. If we do have to come back out here, you two guys are each getting quick. Got it. I understand. And is that that's the bottom row of the house there? Which one? Over here? That yeah. one? That one's up on, uh, goes through that driveway. The guy's walking right there. Oh, yeah. That side there. We're clear of 1127 King Road. We're going to be out at 1122 Queen Road. Same problem. Hey, guys, can you send someone out who lives here, please? How are you? Good, how are you? Good, is this your place? Yeah. Perfect, you know why we're here? Uh, and I assume noise. Noise, yeah. Yeah. Big speaker right there? Yeah. Nothing against having a party. Once neighbors start calling in, then we have an issue. Fair. Uh, you go to school? Uh, yeah. Okay, what year? Senior. Senior, okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you the same thing I told them. You probably know the drill, right? Actually, no. Oh, okay. So usually, at least for me, I'll give you a verbal warning. Okay. Uh, once I have neighbors calling in, your music's too loud. You're disturbing the peace. Yeah. Nothing against having parties. Nothing against having people over who are overage to drink. Mm -hmm. But again, once we start disturbing the neighbors, then we've got an issue. Yeah. Noise ticket is up to 300. Yeah, and... somewhere around 300. Okay. It's a pretty expensive ticket. I don't want to give that to you. Yeah. That being said, this is your place, so I'm going to hold you responsible. Uh -huh. you because it is your place, you're also responsible for everybody here. Yeah. So I'm going to grab your info. Yeah. Um, and if I do have to come back here, uh, a 300 some dollar tickets coming your way. Okay. And it only gets more expensive from there. Is that fair? Yeah, that's okay. fair. Absolutely. Hey, ladies, how's it going? Oh, hi. How are you? Good. Um, uh, we're not actually. Do you want to look a little No. No, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, they did. Get on the damn door. <coughs> Look at that. Hey, who's the owner uh, or who's who lives here? Um, I can go get them real quick. Okay, thank please. you, please. Um, so, yeah, I just looked for everyone that was here and they're not here right now. No one's here that no one's here that no, looks no, at all. No one's here that lives so here. So everyone here is trespassing? Well, no one's here that's trespassing, but no one, no one that lives here is here right now. So where'd they go? They're just not here. I have no clue where they went. No clue. So you guys just throwing a party in in, in their house at this they time? Were here at one point, they're not here right now. I just I they, just searched all the rooms. They left and went over to some other party, and everyone is about to I leave and go over to another party. Okay. Who does live here? What are their names? I am actually not sure. I live across the street. I just came over. I haven't drank a drop. Male, female? female. Uh, I think it's mainly females. I think it's like four females. What sorority are they affiliated with? I um, don't know. Because I, do I guarantee us, you there's a lot of underage drinking because they left their alcohol behind. Do you want us to try and get a name or a phone number Please, and if we can could. call someone? We just I, need to I talk to somebody who lives here because okay. otherwise I have yeah. to be under the assumption you guys are unlawfully entered because no one who lives here is here. Okay. Right? We'll, we'll go. We'll so go I get need to verify number. that there was a party here. We'll, no, everyone left, we'll go get so a phone number. We'll be right back. Thanks, Sorry, guys. we're not trying to make your life. I understand. Yeah. I just letting you know this is how it's going to play out. I'm not Perfect. going anywhere until I talk no, to somebody. We'll be, we'll be right back. Just you guys mind just leaving the door open for us? That way we can get yeah. some sort of communication between us no, and them. No, we're not going to come in. No, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I know I do. And, and, hey guys. Really, we're just coming here for noise complaint. Okay, so no, we understand y'all drinking. For right? reason, I, I apologize for no one coming to the door. The it's, issue was it, we were okay. trying to find the Everyone's kind of freaked out because cops are here. You guys are having a good time, right? Well, I just, I mean, I've been at another house before and I went out and talked to the cops, yeah. but I wasn't the no resident, so they just told me to go back inside, yep. basically. So no worries. So, hey, we'll just go ahead and, and, we'll and get the contact. We'll call Thanks, man. We'll be right back. All right, Josh. Jordan, you talked to Yep. Maddie. Um, this is one of the owners of us here. She's okay. on the phone right now. Hi, this is Officer Walsh from Moscow Police Department. Who am I speaking with? Maddie, one second. Let me turn the volume up on on this uh, on this phone here. All right, can you hear me, Maddie? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Do you live at 1122 uh, Queen Street? Yes, I do. Okay. So, hey, the reason that we're here is that we received a noise complaint um, of live music, partying, okay? 
once we approached the the house, uh, people started running away. Uh, they left a bunch of alcohol behind. We're not even coming for alcohol. We're coming for the noise complaint. All right, Madison. So here's the deal. Okay, they've already said that no one here lives at, uh, like none of the, the occupants that live at this address are here right now. So now you have a house full of random people. Um, you need to let them know that the noise needs to needs to come down. Okay, we just received a, a noise complaint. We want that music turned down. Um, and we don't want to come back again tonight. If we have to come back again tonight, then there's going to be even more problems, okay? And again, if I have to come back later tonight, like I said, I, I just want to express that there's going to be some uh, some citations given out, okay? Okay, very clear. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you enjoy your evening, all right? You too. Bye. I can hear music. I can't tell where it's coming from. 4078. It's going to be this 1222, or correction, 1122 Queen Road up here. Hey guys, Moscow PD. Hey. Turn the music down. Turn the music down. Hey guys, second time. I need one. I need somebody to come to the door. Music stays off. Party's over. Hello, Hello, miss. What's your name? Zana. Zana, do you live here? Yes. Hey, did Megan talk to you earlier? I, no. Okay, does Megan live here? Megan, I do not have a Megan that lives Megan here. Mogan? Mad or Mad uh, Mogan, yes. Madison Mogan, yeah. Madison Mogan? Okay, she does Sorry, live here. Sorry, we, she is at the club. She's 21. I'm just going to bed. I have a couple friends over, but okay. this is my ID. Have you talked to Maddie tonight? Yes, I have. Oh. She's at the cl corner club. Okay. Did she did she tell you anything about anything that happened earlier or anything like that? Honestly, not really. I'm I've just been here the past hour. Okay. okay. Just trying to go to bed. Can it, I grab your ID for me? You yeah, right I'm here. not yeah. twenty one. I okay. my roommates are twenty one. Just well, to go to bed. We're, we're not here for we're not here to talk about the alcohol stuff, okay? Okay, yeah. Um, but th this is the second noise complaint we've had here tonight within two hours. I'm sorry. Okay? <clears throat> I'm telling you right now, if we have to come back, you're getting a ticket. Okay, so I'm not right now. I'm fine right now. You're not gonna take. I'm right just now. trying to go to bed right okay. now. I mean, I I understand you guys. You're coming here. I'm I'm just going. To bed. Okay. Well, understand that you're responsible for the residents. Okay. So, whoever else is here, if they have a safe way to get home, you need to kick them out. Okay. Or tell them to come inside and be quiet. Okay. Because the houses that are on this hill all the way around here, we can hear you from clear down the road when we were coming up here. You can hear the music. Okay. And that's, I'm so sorry. We're, we're past the point of having polite conversations, okay? Because yeah. so neighbors sorry. are being kept up. Okay? I'm sorry. And, and I'm not saying that you got to tell everybody they have to leave, but I'm telling you, any outside music... Any loud yelling needs to be done. Okay. Because we're not, next time you're getting a ticket. Okay. Okay? And if you get a misdemeanor citation, the university is not going to take kindly to it. Yeah. So I, not only I do you have to go see the judge. I understand I've never had to deal with this ever. Yep. And we don't want to start now. I don't ever remember having come here, so I understand you guys are having to get together, but people have a way of yes. taking the invitation and using it as an excuse to get out of control you and be loud. Advantage. Yes, exactly. I okay. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I just I just hope for your sake that your friends don't put you in a position where yeah. you get the citation and you have to go to court to defend yourself yes. from your friend's behavior. Make sense? Okay. Thank you so okay. much. You want to get a good phone number for her? Yep. You are? Zana Kernodle. X-A-N-A-K-E-R-N-O-D-L-E. -E. Awesome. Well, thank you, Zana. Here's course. your ID back. Thank you so much. Any, yep. any questions? No questions. Okay. Make sure your friends don't put you in a bad position. Tell them it's I time will. to be done. I'll go okay. There's like no one in there. Yeah. It was the two that were around the back. We had to holler at them and turn the music down. So. Thank all right. you guys. I'm so sorry. Nope, that's all right. You take care, okay? Thank you. Quickly after learning the timeline of when Kaylee and Maddie returned home, it was revealed that the girls made a series of phone calls to Kaylee's on and off again boyfriend, Jack. The phone calls take place from approximately 2.26 a.m. to 2.44 a.m. Kaylee called Jack six times. Then from 2.44 a.m. to 2.52 a.m., Maddie called Jack three times. And then at 2.52 a.m., Kaylee makes a final call to Jack. This quickly made the public speculate that perhaps there was a lover's spat 
and potentially retaliation or a crime of passion. But this was quickly debunked by police, and it appeared that it was just a case of young adult rapid fire calling. Jack's aunt spoke out and said that Jack is mourning the love of his life. And Kaylee's family had said similar things about Jack and about him being 1000% innocent, adding that Kaylee and Jack would have been married, they would have had kids, and they would have been together the rest of their life, that kind of love. So Jack, no longer a suspect according to public opinion. So who was responsible for these four brutal murders? Yeah, Annie, that's the real question on everyone's mind. It's important to note that Jack D isn't the same person as Jack Showalter from the food truck. But to further put things into perspective when it comes to Jack D, imagine you and your partner of five years had just broken up three weeks ago. You're still friends, you still love her, you still share a dog named Murphy together, and there's a good chance that at some point, you may even get back together. But tragically, the last person she tried to get a hold of moments before she was brutally murdered was you. And all the while, you weren't even that far from where she was. How would you feel in Jack D's shoes at that point? Well, if you're any part human, then you'd be crushed, broken, and you'd have just had your heart stolen from your very chest and you'd beat yourself up about what you wish you would have done through sleepless night after sleepless night. And parallel to this, you'd also have to face angry cops that grill you for God knows how long in a manner that probably makes you feel like you're being accused of a crime that destroyed the thing you love the most when all you want to do is rewind time and just answer that damn phone. And that's only the start of your problems. To top it off, half the internet thinks you're responsible and they're boldly announcing their baseless and sensitive claims from the safe rooftops of social media everywhere. You can't open your phone, you can't turn on the TV or computer, you can't do anything. Her face is everywhere. So are the faces of her friends who were probably your friends too. Then everyone has a stupid comment about how guilty you look or how much they have a feeling you did it. But the truth is, you're also a victim, and this tragedy will affect you for the rest of your life. If there was ever a moment in the internet's history that turned my stomach, it's this one. The attack on Jack D showcased the worst of mankind's narcissism, unapologetic insensitivity, and mass lack of empathy. The people that did this are heartless. You know, it's one thing to have opinions or theories backed up by evidence, but it's another thing to publicly go after someone who's dealing with a ridiculous level of trauma when you have zero facts to back up your baseless attacks. In the words of Joey Swole, we need, need to, to do, do better. better. And if you can't, then mind, mind your, your own, own business. business. This kid's hurting real bad right now. Send him love and well wishes, not death threats and unfounded disrespectful speculation. Jack D, if you hear this, I hope those around you carry you through this awful time. You're undeserving of the way you've been treated online. It may not seem like it right now, but it will get better. Keep your head up, man. One of her last messages, she reached out to Jack and said, Jack, get back to me. And he didn't, she goes, we share a dog together, which they did. She's like, you need to reach out to me, so. Please come over. She was wanting Jack to come over. There, Jack is, um, is, is not, um, they're wasting their time with Jack. And, yeah. and, and Jack is just as distraught as we are. Um, Jack is our family. We love Jack. Absolutely love Jack. We stand behind Jack 1,000%. Jack was Kaylee's boyfriend for many years. They just recently broke up. There was no animosity at all. It was a breakup on Kaylee's point. It was not, they still talked every single day. Kaylee just thought that she needed a little break. They were on the mends of getting back together. Kaylee talked to Jack the whole time. She was here for that week and a half. There were fleeting reports that Kaylee had complained in the past about a stalker. However, investigators looked extensively into this, and they say that they had pursued hundreds of pieces of information about this and have not verified or identified anybody that could be a stalker. Because Kaylee's dog Murphy was at the house when the slaying occurred, many believed that he must have had blood on him or would have barked unless he knew who the perpetrator was. But police said that Murphy was unharmed and in another room entirely and never around the crime scene. Murphy is currently living safely and happily with Kaylee's ex-boyfriend, Jack. As the public continued looking for answers and any information regarding this case, there were two other roommates in the home when this crime took place, but both of them survived. This had the public reeling because this meant that those two roommates were at the house while Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan were murdered early Sunday morning. 
yet nobody called 911 to report the incident until around 11 a.m. the following morning. After the murders, it was initially believed that the two surviving roommates were out in the Moscow community hanging out separately Saturday night and that they both returned home at approximately 1 a.m. and that both roommates did not wake up until later that morning. On November 13th, the day of the murders, when the girls woke up, they asked friends to come over because they believed one of the second floor victims had passed out and was not waking up. At 11.58 a.m., the 911 call requested aid for an unconscious person. This call was made from one of the surviving roommate's cell phones and multiple people talked to the dispatcher. Now, it's not clear if the phone was passed around person to person or if it was on speakerphone, and that is why multiple people spoke with the dispatcher. The 911 call still has not been released. When officers came to the house, they found two victims on the second floor and two on the third floor. One of the main questions when this information was released was why were the roommates spared in this entire tragedy? If the two roommates were spared, was the killer truly only after the other four students? There wasn't any sign of forced entry, so was this killer just lying in wait for the students' arrival back home late that night? Police Chief James Fry repeatedly acknowledged the suspect is still out there, but continued to reiterate that the department believed that this was an isolated, calculated attack on the victims. Now, surely the police would find some type of evidence left behind. Fingerprints, bloody shoe prints, something to identify who was responsible for these deaths. Usually, in such gruesome stabbings, such as these, there's DNA left at the crime scene, because knife attacks generally result in the suspect cutting themselves, especially if they are attacking as many as four people, one being an athletic male. However, one of the largest hurdles in collecting the DNA and finding a single source match to the killer was how much traffic was in and out of that house. King Road was by all definitions a party house. There were multiple noise complaints called into the local police, and there was seemingly a party there many days of the week. It's a typical college house close to campus and Greek life on campus, and based on body cam footage that has been released from a few of those police calls to the home, it certainly does show how open and accessible the house was from time to time with people coming and going at all hours, making it very challenging to single out a singular source of DNA from the multiple amounts more than likely left behind inside that house. Yo, is it okay if I have a party? Like just three or four people at most. Autopsies of all four victims took place on November 17th, 2022, and their causes and manner of death were ruled homicide by stabbing. The county coroner, Kathy Mabbott, said that all four victims were likely asleep. Some had defensive wounds and each were stabbed multiple times. She did, however, say that there were not any signs of sexual assault. But as the timeline of that fateful morning became more clear, the evidence indicated that more than likely the students were awake during the murders and that one of them may possibly have been the killer's original target. Weeks went by and there were no arrests, no public leads, and the public began fearing that this case was going cold. Kaylee's dad, Steve, appeared on multiple news channels trying to find answers and expressed his growing frustration with the police. I hope people understand how all these kids that were a part of this were doing everything right. And they were gonna be the type of people that you wanted to be your neighbor. I'm truly responsible for my daughter dying because it's a father's job to keep their children protected. And I, uh, I obviously didn't live up to that. Everybody wants it to go away, and it needs to go away, but it can only go away when we have justice. There's so much speculation because there is no information. There's that void and there's that gap that it, it gets filled with a lot of times nonsense and, and rumors and, and false narratives. Still, this father believes law enforcement should include the community more in terms of getting help in the investigation. I don't feel the leadership and the confidence level is there. I mean, I want to see a guy stand up there and say, hey, we're going to get this guy. Still no leads on a possible suspect from Moscow police, but Steven Gonzalez has this to say about the killer. He's just a coward who found some people sleeping in their bed. 
I mean, it's about as wimpy and cowardly as anybody could do. Good evening, America, and welcome to the special edition of Cross Country on location in Moscow, Idaho. It's been about two weeks since the University of Idaho students were stabbed to death in their beds while they slept in that home right behind me. In a town that never used to lock their doors, locksmiths are now being flooded with calls. College students are now considering online classes. And while rumors are swirling here, everyone is in agreement on one thing. Justice must be served. We have walked this crime scene, followed the timeline of this case, and asked investigators to answer some of the many unanswered questions about this brutal crime. And joining me again tonight, Steve Gonzalez, father of Kaylee Gonzalez. Sir, thank you so much for joining me uh, tonight. We continue to grieve with you and your family, and we're hoping to get answers for you. Sir, what, when was the last time you talked with law enforcement about the case? Well, we just had a vacation. Uh, law enforcement told me that um, they were going to drop off a little bit and not to expect the same type of um, communication that I had gotten before. They passed it on to another person. So basically, long story short, it was Wednesday, 5 p.m. was the last time that they reached out to me. So, yeah, that's rough. So what are they telling you? They're kind of just telling me that they can't tell me much. Which is frustrating to me because I've been very um, trust, trustworthy. I, I, I don't, I do know things. I haven't shared things. Um, we're the same family that found the original timeline. We're the same family that broke into the phones. We tried everything in our ability to try to get into this system because a court order is not the fastest thing. So we, we broke in and we did what we did. We know that we have some family passwords that we all share. So we broke in and we helped them. So it, it, it's hard for me to give up as a father, my protective ability to other men. Sir, they have shared with us that it was a targeted attack. Can you give us any information about that? Have they told you who the target was? Or, or giving you more insight than they have the public? They, I don't want to talk bad about them because these are some hardworking individuals and I have, I'm doomed without them. We're all doomed without sure. them. This defund police is just a terrible idea. The fact that we're finding out that there's more than just my daughter and these children that have suffered, it's terrible to think that we can defund these guys. It's an absolute atrocity that's not something that is um it's political it's not political this is just facts guys we can't allow these people to just run free so beyond that they haven't shared a lot we have some private detectives that have reached out to us and given us information we take that with a grain of salt and we try to be careful just today i reached out to the officers and said hey this guy's treated me through respect on the show i'd like to share some things with him that uh, that that i found out on my own and they asked me to not do that so we're, we're holding our tongue we're waiting patiently but we're definitely concerned kaylee's parents spoke out about the murders being targeted like the police said and in one of their interviews they revealed that maddie and kaylee's autopsies did not match saying that their points of damage don't match. You, you've said both now to Rachel and then I, in, in the clip in your appearance with Lawrence Jones that the, your daughter and, and Maddie had different means or manner of, of attack and that suggests one of them was targeted. Um, can you share with us, do you know, and you can't share either way, which one was targeted? I can't, I asked for permission to do just that and they said no. Um, I probably over it, it disclosed information that they wish I wouldn't have said, but this sto the story's going mm -hmm. cold. There's less people coming to Moscow. Um, I'm not going to go sleep in my bed knowing that I could get up and I could go to town and I could I could do something. And I'm not going to go away. And I, I hate to be a pain, but as a father, I just can't even sleep thinking that I, I could be doing something. So 
That's, that. what, that's why I'm not. Kaylee's dad, Steve, wasn't specific on what didn't match, like if Maddie or Kaylee were hurt more than the other. However, he did say, and I quote, he doesn't have to go up the steps. There's a couple things that tell me with common sense, but um, I'm not a professional, so I want to specify that. But they've said the entry point was the slider or the window. It was in the middle floor. So to me, he doesn't have to go upstairs. His entry and exit are available without having to go upstairs or downstairs. Looks like he probably may have not gone downstairs. I, we don't know that for sure, but he obviously went upstairs. So I'm using logic that um, he chose to go up there when he didn't have to. And um, I can kind of tell by my daughter's texts, messages. She didn't call 911. She wasn't uh, saying anything along the lines of like she had heard something or she was in fear. So I'm just putting the, the, the dots together. This led many people to believe that Steve was indicating that Kaylee or Maddie were in fact the target, which is why the killer went upstairs to locate them. And one day after this interview, it was released that Kaylee's injuries were significantly more brutal than the other three students. In one of these many interviews, Kaylee's dad, Steve, describes that conversation with the coroner, Kathy Mabbutt. Steve asked her how many times the victims had been stabbed, and apparently her response was that she doesn't think stabs is the right word. It was more like tears. This was a strong weapon, not a stab. Steve elaborated on this more and said, she said that these were big open gouges. She said it was quick and that this wasn't something where you would be able to call 911, that they were not going to slowly bleed out. He also said that a knife slashed open Kaylee's liver and lungs. Steve added with his frustration, there are girls walking around the street right now in Moscow that deserve to know this. They deserve to know the truth and that they should be looking out for a sadistic male. He also clarified his thoughts on whether Maddie or Kaylee was the target. And he said he didn't know, but that he had his suspicions. Ethan and Zana were found on the second floor. And Steve said that it was a hell of a battle going on down there from what the coroner had told them. Clearly, they knew it was a brutal murder, but now with this new information, it felt like the word brutal didn't even accurately describe it. The last thing that Steve said in this interview was that even though the coroner told them that they likely died quickly, he doesn't believe that. This case is not going cold. We have tips coming in. We have investigators out every day interviewing people. We're still reviewing evidence. We're still looking at um, all aspects of this. And I said early on that um, no stone will go unturned. And I mean that we are gonna continue. Um, this case is not going cold. I'm a dad um, with daughters and um, that's tough. You know, you don't, you know, we're human. We don't, we don't go to these and um, just turn it off. Um, it affects us, uh, but um, we have a job to do and we're gonna continue to do that job. We're gonna continue to push forward. Weeks went by and investigators went back and forth to the house several times for various reasons. Sometimes they went inside the house and looked like they were gathering more evidence or taking pictures. And on one visit, they were seen outside of the house overseeing the victim's cars being towed from the property. Police made multiple visits to gather evidence, taking out mattresses and boxing up some of the personal belongings from the victims in their rooms. A candlelight vigil was held on November 30th, 2022 at the University of Idaho in Moscow and the Boise campus. The University of Idaho in Moscow offered different learning options for the rest of the semester and also increased campus security and counseling was made available for all of the students. The family, friends, and public all wanted answers, but there was seemingly nothing, just theories, speculation, and of course, lots of rumors. But finally, on December 7th, 2022, the Moscow Police Department released a statement that finally had some new information. They said that detectives were interested in speaking with the occupants of a white 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra with an unknown license plate. 
They also said that tips and leads had led investigators to look for additional information about this vehicle being in the immediate area of the King Road residence during the early morning hours of November 13th. Investigators believed that the occupants of this vehicle may have critical information to share regarding the case. And this was definitely the biggest update in the case so far at this point. So we have uh, um, information of a white vehicle that was in the area um, either during the time frame of the homicide or around the time frame of the homicide. And we are just wanting to talk to the individuals who are in that vehicle. Um, they may have some valuable information for us. And we're looking for a 2011 to a 2013 Hyundai Elantra. So any assistance you can give us, um, anybody that owns one, anybody that knows of someone who owns one or may have been driving one, if you could get a hold of us um, through our tip line or um, call us directly, um, we'd appreciate that. Shortly after the information about the white Elantra was released, the University of Idaho's winter graduation weekend came. Kaylee was supposed to walk the stage that day. Police released a statement warning the public to stay vigilant, exercising all safety precautions and advising them to stay in groups. Now this once again had many people confused, because if this was a targeted crime, either against the four victims or the house itself, why did people still need to stay in groups all weekend? Did the police think that the killer would strike again? Did the Moscow Police Department have information that the killer might be somebody local? The Moscow Police Department reiterated that this was just advice that everyone should take no matter what, and that there was not a specific threat. But what was the truth here? The graduation ceremony also marked the end of the semester, and nearly all of the students returned home for winter break. With speculation that the case was going cold and the near silence from the police, students were getting nervous as they would all be soon returning to Moscow for the spring semester. As speculation grew, there were multiple Facebook groups created, Reddit threads started, TikTok circulating, where people shared their theories, their suspects, and what they believed the motive was. With new posts surfacing every minute, it was very hard to keep track of what was fact and what was fiction. And with no news or information released from the police aside from the elusive white Elantra, it allowed the speculation to grow and grow and grow. But what nobody knew, the police had been zeroing in on somebody since very early on into the investigation. And it wouldn't be long now until the house of cards began to fall for this alleged killer. I'm Vinny Politan, great to have you with us here tonight on Closing Arguments. Uh, we've got a lot to get to, and really the big question tonight is, is this it? Is this the big break, the clue, the evidence that's gonna lead to an arrest in the murder in Idaho? Just before the new year, there was a massive break in the case. 28-year-old Brian Koberger was arrested and charged with four counts of first-degree murder along with a felony burglary charge. The felony burglary charge is for committing a felony after breaking into a home. More than six weeks after four University of Idaho students were murdered in their apartment just blocks away from campus, police say they have arrested a suspect. 28-year-old Brian Koberger was arrested in northeastern Pennsylvania and is awaiting extradition to Idaho on a warrant for fugitive from justice. Good afternoon. I'm Colonel Robert Ivanchik, Commissioner of the Pennsylvania State Police. While I monitored the investigation into the horrific murders of the University of Idaho students, I did not imagine the investigation would lead to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I need to acknowledge the members of the Pennsylvania State Police, members of Troop N, our Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and our Bureau of Emergency and Special Operations, who assisted in safely taking the suspect into custody in the early morning hours of December 30th. As previously indicated by Chief James Fry of the Moscow Police Department, specific details regarding this investigation cannot be released until the suspect is extradited to Idaho and presented with the probable cause affidavit. So this begins when the Pennsylvania State Police Bureau of Criminal Investigation troopers were contacted by the FBI about assisting with surveillance of the accused in this case. So as the investigation progressed, 
Troop N Criminal Investigation Section began to collaborate with authorities in Idaho. Uh, it was through this collaboration and the charges pending in Idaho that uh, those troopers were able to obtain search warrants and a fugitive from justice warrant that was prepared here in Monroe County. Once those warrants were obtained, tactical assets were then staged in the county, in Monroe County, uh, into the evening of Thursday, December 29th. And in the early hours of Friday, December 30th, those warrants were executed at the location. Mr. Koberger was taken into custody without incident. The scene was turned over to the FBI. Mr. Koberger was then turned over to the Monroe County Prison, where he has remained in their custody since. Arrangements currently are being made to deliver Koberger back to Idaho, where he can have continued due process and face these charges. In what seemed like a lifetime, but really was only 47 days, the Moscow Police Department had a huge press conference where they announced that they had their suspect in custody and that he was charged with the brutal slayings of Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal. Now, if you thought that this killer may have been a college student and that's who committed this heinous crime, you were right. Thousands of miles across the country, that's where they found Brian Christopher Kohlberger, the 28-year-old, whose connection to the Palouse here and to this area seems to be that he's a criminology program student. He's a graduate student in the criminology program at Washington State University. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of information, as I said, because of that, but there's a lot of things we do not know. Like, when did Kohlberger become a suspect? How long have they been tracking him? What made this arrest possible today? and there were even questions of a motive. But again, none of that information was provided today. When asked if there was anyone else possibly involved in this case, Chief Fry said, we have an individual in custody who committed these horrible crimes. As you remember, this has been six long weeks. And as ter terrible it has been for this community, waiting with bated breath for any sort of break in the case like this, the police, the FBI, the sheriff's office here and even Idaho State Police have been fully involved in this investigation. And as stressful and as difficult the last six weeks have been, Chief Fry mentioned today that those emotions peaked the past couple of days while they were waiting for this arrest to happen on the other side of the country. I can tell you um, for a lot of law enforcement, it was a fairly sleepless a um, couple of days with um, as we were leading up to everything that we were doing. But um, what I can tell you is um, I have faith in those agencies across the nation. Um, I have faith in our officers. I have faith in the FBI and uh, they did a great job. Um, but sure, there was uh, some times um, even throughout um, the day that uh, we were uh, always concerned. That was something that Chief Fry was adamant about, that he was confident they were going to find a suspect in this case. And as you heard him say, yeah, there were a couple of moments, the last couple of days, that things got a little tense, and now they have somebody in custody. At the time of his arrest, Brian was staying at his parents' home in a gated community in Chestnut Hill Township, Pennsylvania, near the Poconos, when he was arrested around 3 a.m. Friday morning on December 30th, 2022, during a SWAT raid. A 2015 white Elantra was also found at his parents' house and was seized. Brian was taken to Monroe County Jail, where he awaited extradition back to Idaho. Brian was assigned a public defender in Pennsylvania to oversee the extradition process, and Brian asked him to relay a statement from him, which stated, Brian is eager to be exonerated of these charges and looks forward to resolving these matters as promptly as possible. He also intends to waive his extradition hearing to expedite his transport back to Idaho. When the Moscow Police Department held a press conference that afternoon to announce this news, they weren't able to provide much information other than the arrest because of Idaho laws. Brian had to be in custody in Idaho before his arrest warrant would be made public. They did confirm that they couldn't talk about the motive and also stated that they still had not found the murder weapon. Although there were little answers, the public was over the moon. Finally, there was an arrest and answers were beginning to surface about who was responsible for this brutal quadruple murder. But who is Brian Koberger? Jessica Crayhansel. Jenna Cook. Brian Koberger. Brian Koberger is a 28-year-old and grew up in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. 
He has two siblings, and his parents are very closely involved in his life. Brian graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in criminal justice from DeSales University in Pennsylvania. At the time of his arrest, Brian was a PhD criminology student and a teaching assistant at Washington State University's Pullman campus, which is approximately a 15-minute drive from Moscow, Idaho. After his identity was released, a few students from the criminology program at WSU spoke out and said that Brian didn't act like anything was weird at all immediately following the murders. They said that he was usually quiet and kind of weird in the first place, but they didn't notice anything totally off. One student even said he seemed more upbeat and willing to carry on a conversation. One of the classes that Brian was in actually discussed the murders, and apparently Brian didn't act phased either way. A different classmate, however, said, he sort of creeped people out because he stared and didn't talk much, but when he did, it was very intelligent, and he needed everybody to know that he was smart. Another grad student commented on Brian's arrest, saying it was pretty out of left field, saying that he took several courses with Brian, and that Brian was always looking for a way to fit in, and would find the most complicated way to explain something, and he had to make sure that you knew that he knew the answer and that he was correct. A girl who knew Brian in high school posted a few TikTok videos where she talked about Brian being one of her brother's friends and that she and the rest of her family were floored when they heard the news of his arrest. Okay, um, I don't have many followers, so I'm not sure who uh, this is going to reach out to, but regarding the case of the four Idaho uh, students that were slain, and the arrest that was made. Um, I used to be friends with Brian Kohlberger during my middle and high school years. And then before anyone comes at me and says that I'm just running for clout, I'm not. I have pictures that I will show you. I have screenshots that I will show you. I have terrible pictures that I show you. I went to school with the kid. I was friends with him. I'm, I wouldn't make something like this up. I am just an absolute shop right now. I was heading to lunch when my mom called me and immediately I knew something was off because I have the type of family that we don't call each other. So if someone does call someone, um, we know something's bad. Uh, she called me and asked me about the, the murders. Um, I didn't know where she was going with it until she said that it was Brian Koberger and naturally I freaked out and called about eight of my friends. Um, my brother was really good friends with him. My other friend, was really good friend, friends with him. I want to have a picture of him with him um, on the green screen as well. I'm shaking still, um, but anyway, let me let me show you. This is back. This is the one I was talking about. It's his wife, and that's me. This was back in 2017. Obviously, that's Brian. Um, still has the dead face. That it's the eyes. I don't know. Um, but when I spoke to him back in 2017, he was clean. Um, he was a heavy heroin user uh, back in high school, and um, it was just nice to see the kid clean up. And at that time, he said he was doing security detail. I believe it was out of school is what he told me. Um, but he seemed like he was better. Obviously, that wasn't true. Here's another picture from a party that we had at his house. That's Brian there. He used to be a bigger kid as well. Um, but again, that's him. And then at the same wedding, I'm here, but he's back there. He was out sitting at the same table as me and my mother, um, but he is back there enjoying a drink. I was sitting right next to him. We talked, he seemed fine. My mom sent me the old school yearbook. That was him, Brian Koberger, that's him. He went to Pleasant Valley. He graduated with, I think my friend, a year um, older, sorry, younger than me. This is when he, um, nonchalantly decided to make me drive him around the Poconos for heroin and I had no idea. I thought I was just doing a nice deed because he needed something and it turns out that he was getting heroin. Um, sorry, I'm like, my voice is shaking. I might make a part two. I can't really have to. I don't have a six minute feature. I only have a three minute feature. I also talk really fast, so I'm sorry. She also mentioned that there was a period of time that Brian was struggling with addiction, but said that the last time she saw him in 2017, he looked healthy and like everything was good. She also recalled how Brian treated her brother in the past, saying that Brian would make her brother feel bad, would mock his intelligence, and almost do it as a way to make himself feel better. 
Other people that went to high school with Brian told news outlets that Brian was mocked by classmates for being socially awkward and overweight, and that girls sometimes would even throw things at him. Then at some point before his senior year of high school, Brian lost a lot of weight and turned into an aggressive bully. Allegedly, one of his former family members spoke out and said that Brian was also a vegan who had extreme OCD eating habits and wanted his aunt and uncle to buy new pots and pans and refused to ever eat anything that had ever been cooked with meat in them. Before moving to Washington, Brian visited the Seven Sirens Brewing Company near DeSales University in Pennsylvania several times, and allegedly he was often harassing the women who worked there, as well as some of the customers. Allegedly, if the women weren't interested in his advances, there were times where he got really upset. One time he even called the bartender a B-I-T-C-H. Apparently this happened so frequently that female employees and customers complained to the manager and Brian was flagged in their ID scanning system for anyone who comes into the brewery. The warning was something along the lines of, this guy makes creepy comments, keep an eye on him, he'll have two or three beers and then just get a little too comfortable. One time the manager said that he had to approach Brian and say, hey Brian, welcome back, we appreciate you coming back, but I just wanted to talk to you really quick and make sure that you are going to be respectful this time and that we're not going to have any issues. To which Brian acted stunned and replied saying, I don't know what you're talking about. You have me totally confused. Just playing very aloof about the entire situation. The day of Brian Koberger's arrest, his Reddit account was also found online, and there was a very intriguing post about a research study for ex-convicts, where he was asking for participants to help with an anonymous 15 to 20 minute survey for his master's program at DeSales University. The survey very well could have been for his school study, but many believed that it appeared that Brian was attempting to map out the blueprint to commit a perfect crime or maybe that he was so curious about what it would feel like that he almost wanted to live vicariously through the responses. Is it possible that maybe this study was for both academic purposes at first and then later spread on social media for his own personal curiosity? Perhaps. Was he thinking about this or fantasizing about committing the murders all the way since this was posted last summer? Was he hoping that the answers from others would perhaps satisfy some sick urges deep down, but in reality, it did the opposite and it surfaced those urges? Or was this truly an attempt to learn from the mistakes of other criminals to become an expert at this? Some criminal psychologists have said that Brian could have very well chosen his area of study to figure himself out or why he feels like this or even had a sinister motive to perfect his craft. Either way, it's very rare that somebody studying in the field at the PhD level is actually a psychopathic budding serial killer. But it does make sense that Brian was into that just from what we know about the crime so far. Dr. Catherine Ramsland is a professor of forensic psychology and criminal justice and an expert in serial killers at DeSales University. She has written 60 books and more than 1,000 articles about crime, forensic science, and the supernatural. Some of her most famous books include How to Catch a Killer, Hunting and Capturing the World's Most Notorious Serial Killers, and Inside the Minds of Serial Killers and Why They Kill. Brian took a class from Catherine while studying at DeSales. Law and Crime reached out to Dr. Ramsland about this case and she replied that she can't make any media statements about him at this time. However, one of the reporters from Law and Crime said that she spoke to one of the students who took that class with Brian. And the student told her that Brian often interrupted Dr. Ramsland and would talk over her as if he knew more about the subject matter than she did. So did Brian think he was smarter than a actual serial killer expert? Brian Koberger was extradited to Moscow, Idaho on January 4th, 2023, and appeared in court on January 5th. He was not offered any bond after officially being charged for the four counts of first-degree murder and felony burglary for the deaths of Ethan, Zana, Maddie, and Kaylee. The magistrate judge presiding over the case preemptively put out a gag order on Moscow police, as well as the attorneys for the prosecution and the defense. Once Brian was back in Idaho and appeared in court, his arrest affidavit was finally made public. 
providing more insight about how the events unfolded that horrific night that Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, Maddie Mogan, and Kaylee Gonzalez were brutally murdered in their own home. All right. This is State of Idaho versus Brian C. Kohlberger, cause number CR 2922-2805. Mr. Kohlberger is present in court. He is in custody. He is appearing with his attorney, Ms. Taylor. Mr. Thompson, Ms. Jennings, on behalf of the state. This is the time set in the matter for initial appearance. Mr. Kohlberger, I am going to advise you of the rights that you have in this case. You have the following rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to the presumption of innocence. That means the state bears the burden to prove that you are guilty of this offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The state must establish that more likely than not, these felony offenses were committed and you were the one that committed the felony offenses. You can enter a plea of not guilty and you can have a jury trial set within six months of your appearance in district court. You have the right to confront and question any evidence or witnesses called against you. Call witnesses on your own behalf and compel witnesses to be present and testify at the state's expense. You have the right to be represented by a lawyer. If you cannot afford one, one could be appointed to represent you based upon your financial need. You also have the right to appeal any conviction in your case. Do you understand these rights? Yes. Count one of the criminal complaint charges you with the felony offense of burglary. It alleges that the defendant, Brian C. Koberger, on or about November 13th of 2022, in Lataw County, State of Idaho, did unlawfully enter a residence located at 1122 King Road, Moscow, with the intent to commit the felony crime of murder. The maximum penalty for that offense, if you plead guilty or are found guilty, is not less than one year in prison, no more than 10 years in prison, and or a $50,000 fine or both. Do you understand? Yes. Count two alleges that you committed the felony offense of murder in the first degree. It alleges that the defendant, Brian C. Koberger, on or about November 13th, 2022, in Lataw County, State of Idaho, did willfully, unlawfully, deliberately, with premeditation and with malice of forethought, kill and murder Madison Mogan, a human being, by stabbing Madison Mogan from which she died. The maximum penalty for this offense, if you were to plead guilty or be found guilty, is death or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. Count three alleges that you committed a felony offense of murder in the first degree. According to the affidavit, upon entering the house on 1122 King Road, officers headed toward Zana's room first. Just before the room, they could see the bathroom door. And as the officer approached, he saw Zana's body lying on the floor with wounds that appeared to have been caused by an edged weapon. Also near the room was Ethan Chapin, who was found with sharp force injuries. On the third floor in Kaylee's room, officers found her dog Murphy completely untouched and completely clean. As they entered Maddie's bedroom, they found both Kaylee and Maddie were deceased with visible stab wounds. The officer also saw a tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to Maddie's right side when viewed from the door. The knife sheath had the K-Bar and the United States Marine Corps Eagle Globe and Anchor Insignia stamped on the outside of it. The sheath was collected and sent to the Idaho State Lab for testing, and they had a break in that testing. They were able to determine that there was a single source of male DNA, but they didn't know whose DNA it was. According to the officers, the official timeline of that fateful night goes something like this. By 2 a.m., all of the roommates and Ethan were at the residence and were either in their respective bedrooms or either just hanging out or asleep. Before the arrest affidavit, the public already knew that from approximately 2.26 a.m. to 2.44 a.m., Kaylee had called Jack, her ex, six times. Then from 2.44 a.m. to 2.52 a.m., Maddie called Jack three times. Then at 2.52 a.m., Kaylee makes that final call to Jack. However, as this was all happening, about 10 miles away in Pullman, Washington, at approximately 2.44 a.m., 
that infamous white Elantra was observed on WSU surveillance cameras traveling north on Nevada Street. At approximately 2.53 a.m., that white Elantra was seen traveling southeast on Nevada in Pullman, Washington, towards 270. 270 connects Pullman, Washington to Moscow, Idaho. Later, that same car is picked up again on surveillance and appears to be headed towards 1122 King Road at approximately 3.30 a.m. A review of footage from multiple videos obtained from the King Road neighborhood showed multiple sightings of the white Elantra starting at 3.29 a.m. and ending at 4.20 a.m. These sightings show the vehicle make an initial three passes by the King Road residents. The white Elantra can be seen entering the area a fourth time at approximately 4.04 a.m. Then it can be seen driving eastbound on King Road, stopping and turning around in front of 500 Queen Road, and then driving back westbound on King Road, where the vehicle eventually parks. Then the vehicle is seen departing the area of the King Road residence at approximately 4.20 a.m. at a high rate of speed. The affidavit also provided a different timeline of events as they unfolded those early morning hours. Initially, police said that they believed that the crimes occurred sometime between 3 and 4 a.m., and now that timeline had shifted. At approximately 4 a.m., Zana received a DoorDash delivery from a food delivery service. At 4.04 a.m., that Elantra drives in and makes a U-turn and ends up parking the vehicle. At 4 a.m., one of the surviving roommates, Dylan, said that she woke up because she thought she heard Kaylee upstairs playing with her dog. Dylan then says that a short time later, she hears somebody say there is someone here, thinking it could be Kaylee. And given the timeline we know, Dylan hearing this would have had to have happened after the killer was in the house. Then at 4.12 a.m., according to digital evidence, Zana was active using TikTok on her phone. A short time after that, that is unknown, surviving roommate Dylan heard crying and a male voice say, it's okay, I'm going to help you, which seems as though it would have to have been after Zana was on TikTok because certainly she wouldn't go on TikTok after crying and a man saying that to her. Then at 4.17 a.m., neighbor's audio picks up whimpering, a dog barking, and a loud thud. Around this time, Dylan opens her door for a third time and sees a male in black walking towards her and exit out the sliding glass door. Then based on surveillance footage, at 4.20 a.m., that white Elantra speeds off. Now everything with Zana, Ethan, and Dylan, the surviving roommate, occurred on the second floor. And Dylan's room was also on this second floor, which prior to this, everyone assumed that she was on the first floor, which is why she hadn't heard anything or seen anything. So this was a big bombshell moment and huge detail released. After the affidavit was released, additional chilling details surfaced about that haunting morning. Ethan Chapin was found not in Zana's room, but in the doorway of Zana's room and partially in the hallway, as if he had stepped out of the bedroom to see what was happening or who was there and was met by the killer. It was also reported to News Nation by a source close to the investigation that Ethan's throat had been slashed. That same source confirmed that Kaylee and Maddie were killed first, Ethan was killed third, and Zana was killed last. Zana was found inside her bedroom in her bed and reportedly had put up such a strong fight trying to grab the killer's knife that she not only sustained defensive wounds, but many of her fingers were nearly severed off while trying to fight the killer off. The layout and the floor plan of the house was one of the most troubling parts of the affidavit and this new information, because many suspected that unfortunately Ethan and Zana could have been collateral casualties from being seen that night and that they weren't the target after all. In looking at the angle of the second floor, after coming down the stairs, the killer had no reason to walk down and go after Ethan and Zana. It's not on the way out at all. After coming down the stairs, he could have walked towards the kitchen and then left out the sliding glass door as he did at 4.17 a.m. Instead, the killer walked all the way to the other end of the house, intentionally out of his way to go to Zana's room. So what brought him to Zana's room? Did Ethan step out of the room and take the killer by surprise? 
Did the killer hear Xana on TikTok at 4.12 a.m. and realized that more people were in the home than he initially thought? The affidavit also revealed terrifying insight into Dylan's account of that horrific night, saying that Dylan opened her door for the third time after she heard the crying and a male clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's nose and mouth was walking towards her. She described the figure as 5'10 or taller, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked directly past Dylan as she stood in what she describes as a frozen shock phase. The male then walked towards the back sliding glass door and Dylan locked herself in the room after seeing him. Sorry, Annie. I need to jump back in here for a second and clear some air about the police affidavit. Mainly, our interpretation of the language it uses. Dylan's been getting a lot of overcooked hate stemming from what people feel she should have done or what she didn't do at the time of the crimes. And I think there might be a breakdown somewhere in between the information we were given and what we think we read or heard in the affidavit. So bear in mind that Dylan and Bethany were the first ones home that night. Whether or not Bethany was actually home that night is debatable, but the affidavit states she was. Regardless, let's focus on Dylan who seems to be getting the brunt of the hate. The affidavit states she was woken up at 4 a.m. by what sounded like Kaylee playing with Murphy. But keep in mind that Xana's DoorDash was also around 4 a.m. So we can safely say that Dylan first woke up around the time of Xana's DoorDash and heard what sounded like Kaylee playing with her dog. These are just normal, typical sounds that would occur in a shared college house like this. I think we can all agree there's no need for alarm at this point. Shortly after that, Dylan falls back asleep and is woken up again by hearing what sounded like Kaylee saying, there's someone here. She looked out of her bedroom, saw nothing, and went back to bed. Now, that may sound like cause for concern, but again, in this environment, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary. Zanna had just gotten a DoorDash, Kaylee had been pretty desperate to get a hold of Jack D, and we just don't know the cadence in which Dylan heard what she thought was Kaylee saying, there's someone here. Was the voice scared, loud, laughing, concerned? We don't know. Regardless, traffic in that house is not uncommon or out of the ordinary. Dylan opened up her door a second time and heard someone crying from Xana's room. Then a male voice said, It's okay, I'm going to help you. The affidavit says Dylan closed her door again and went back to bed. After hearing crying for the second time, she opened her door for the third time and saw the bushy eyebrowed man in a mask walk past towards the sliding door as she, and I'm quoting the affidavit here, stood in a frozen shock phase, which is in quotation marks, before locking herself in her bedroom. This is what was stated in the original affidavit. It seems like Dylan saw enough to call for help, but chose not to for eight hours or so. But then News Nation released an article on the 9th of February, 2023, that told a different side of Dylan's story by way of a close source that spoke exclusively with News Nation. According to the source, Dylan opened her bedroom door around 4 a.m. and shouted for everyone to calm down, you're being loud, and I'm trying to sleep. The source also claimed that when Dylan saw the man in the mask, she wasn't scared at all. And yes, she did lock herself in her room, but that doesn't mean she was scared. Ever live in a shared house or university housing? Everyone has a lock on their door. Some even have locks on their cabinets. Most people use a lock when they live in a place like 1122 King Road. Locking yourself in your room at night when you go to sleep is not uncommon. And also, we have proof that 1122 King Road was a party house. Loud noises, drunk housemates, late night door dashes, hell, there's even a video of Xana and Ethan where Ethan has a pantyhose over his head on TikTok. And speaking of that, they all filmed TikToks regularly. Late night ones too, like when Xana was drunk and had lost her vape. And have you listened to Xana's laugh in that video? <laughs> it could easily be confused for a cry. And hey, if Kaylee was so desperate to get a hold of Jack D that night, maybe she simply had a little too much to drink and had become emotional. And perhaps that's the reason she was in Maddie's bed. We simply don't know. But the fact is, Dylan Mortensen probably didn't either. Xana loved to party, and she was clearly the life of the party. And since she was only 20, she couldn't legally drink in the bars. So house parties were probably a regular occurrence. Dylan even noted this when she was impersonating Xana on TikTok. Yo, is it okay if I have a party? Like just three or four people, at most. If you look at things from this angle, you can kind of start to see why Dylan didn't call 911. Maybe she didn't think she needed to. We now know that Dylan called Ethan's best friend and others before the police were called to 11 King Road, roughly eight hours after Dylan locked her bedroom door. I called this next part from the start. While the 911 call was made from Dylan's phone, it was dialed by someone else, the person who discovered Ethan and Xana's body, Ethan Chapin's own best friend. 
My theory, and I'm no expert, is that Dylan got up in the morning and noticed blood on Xana's door. I think the door was probably locked or something heavy was against it. When Dylan couldn't get in or get a response, she called a friend for help because she didn't know what to do. When the friend arrived, they either got into Xana's room and then they called 911, or they may have forced their way in following the advice of 911 to provide aid. This was probably the unconscious person referred to in the report. Or Dylan fainted. Imagine going through what she went through, only to then find out your other two friends upstairs are dead too. Then you gotta face the police, the public, and then yourself. Like Jack D, Jack Showalter, Bethany, and even Maddie's boyfriend Jake. Dylan has been unfairly attacked as she fights the most traumatic thing I can possibly imagine. The last thing she needs right now is blame for unwittingly surviving the quadruple murder of her friends while she slept in the next room. We have a huge knowledge barrier when it comes to this case. We can't fill the gaps with torches and pitchforks, folks. Cognitive dissonance and virtue signaling are no excuse for attacking the survivors in this case. As more information comes to light in the coming months, the picture of what really happened will be painted more clearly. We all want answers. We all want to know what really happened. We won't get there by attacking survivors. Not enough evidence or details have been released that would warrant anyone attacking Dylan Mortensen. Dylan, I hope you get the help and support you deserve during these trying times. Investigators were able to pull a latent shoe print outside of Dylan's doorway, which confirmed her story about seeing the killer walk past her doorway. The affidavit continues stating that after leaving the scene at a high rate of speed at 4.20 a.m., the white Elantra was picked up on five different surveillance cameras returning to Pullman, Washington at 5.25 a.m. and seen again at 5.27 a.m. a little over an hour after leaving the King Road residence. But what is interesting is the drive from Pullman to Moscow and reversed is not an hour long if you're going straight there. The route the Elantra allegedly took made a detour. Was this an effort to evade traffic cameras or an alternative route to maybe dispose of evidence along the way? The police had the connection of the white Elantra to the house and now had a suspect in custody. But when did this investigation lead officers to Brian Koberger as being their suspect? How was he connected? Just a couple of weeks after the murders, on November 29, 2022, a police officer from WSU got a hit on a white Elantra registered to somebody by the name of Brian Koberger. Later that day, the officer went out to see the car and ran its license plate. The vehicle was registered in Washington and did not match the description of the white Elantra without the front license plate that the police were looking for. However, Brian's driver's license picture and height information were eerily similar to the roommate Dylan's description of who she saw leaving the house that night. And while investigating further, police discovered that coincidentally, on November 18th, 2022, five days after the murders, Brian registered his car with Washington and got a new license plate number. Prior to this time, the 2015 white Elantra was registered in Pennsylvania, which does not require a front license plate be displayed. Investigators took this information and began tracking Brian's movements and zeroing in on their suspect. As the investigation continued, Brian finished out the rest of the semester of his criminology PhD at WSU, and at the end of the semester, Brian's dad flew from Pennsylvania to Washington, and the two of them drove together in that Elantra from Washington to Pennsylvania for winter break. Brian's public defender in Pennsylvania, Jason Labar, said that this was a planned trip all along between Brian and his father that they had planned for months prior. Unbeknownst to Brian, investigators had already started looking into him and they were tracking his movements with his car. On December 13th, 2022, the vehicle was captured by a license plate reader in Colorado. And on December 15th, it was captured again when it was run by police that pulled him over in Hancock, Indiana, while on that cross-country road trip with his father. Body cam footage from one of those stops came out, and you can hear more of what is going on in this stop. In this video, Brian just keeps talking about Thai food. Thai food, Thai food, we're going to get Thai food. And then when the officer asks where they're headed, he doesn't give him the final destination. Finally, Brian's dad jumps in and says, well, we're going to Pennsylvania. And Brian seemed very caught off guard when his dad said this, as you can see through his facial expressions in this video when it slowed down. Although investigators were confident that they had their guy, they still didn't have enough evidence to make an arrest. So they continued to monitor Brian's movements. 
While Brian was at his parents' house in Pennsylvania, investigators watched and waited until it was late night and dark outside, and Brian allegedly began deep cleaning the interior and exterior of his car wearing latex gloves. He also allegedly took bags of trash and dumped them in his neighbor's trash can. Little did he know, this would be what police needed to make that arrest. Remember the knife sheath collected by officers at the scene that had that single source of male DNA on the snap button? With that trash recovered from Brian's parents' house in Pennsylvania, the FBI was able to determine whose DNA was on the sheath using genealogical DNA. The results indicated that the DNA from the trash can was within at least a 99.9998% certainty of the suspect's father, meaning that the trash DNA was from Brian's dad, and after testing, it was clear that he was the father of whoever's DNA was on that knife sheath. When the results came back as a match, police were able to secure that arrest warrant, and they made the arrest of Brian Koberger. And DNA wasn't all that investigators had at this point in terms of probable cause for making that arrest of Brian. They had digital evidence as well. According to the affidavit, on August 21st, 2022, Brian was pulled over for a traffic stop and gave police his phone number. So police used that phone number for search warrants to look at cell tower activity, more specifically, Brian's cell tower activity. Cell tower showed that Brian's phone was not in the area of the King Road residence between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. while the murders occurred, but there was an emphasized statement in the affidavit, which read, individuals can either leave their cellular telephone at a different location before committing a crime or turn their cellular telephone off prior to going to a location to commit a crime. This is done by suspects in an effort to avoid alerting law enforcement that a cellular device associated with them was in the particular area where a crime is committed. It also says that on numerous occasions, investigators know that subjects will surveil an area where they intend to commit a crime prior to the date of the crime, and that depending on the circumstances, this could be done from a few days prior to several months prior to the commission of a crime. And that very often times during these types of surveillance, it's possible that the individual does not leave their cellular telephone at a separate location or turn it off since they don't plan to commit the crime on that particular day. So by all accounts, this indicated that Brian did in fact shut off his phone during the time frame of the murders. But police weren't going to let it go, and they suspected that he may have left his phone on during another visit that he made to the home. And it turned out that their hunch was correct. The cell data revealed that Brian's phone pinged in the area of 1122 King Road 12 times prior to the murders. All of the times visited were either late evening or early morning. In addition, Cell data showed Brian's phone was pinging along his route on November 13th, 2022 from Pullman to Moscow, then shut off while at the house and then turned back on again as he allegedly drove back to Washington. Later in the morning of November 13th, after the murders, Brian's phone pinged again near the home at 1122 King Road at 9.12 a.m. and 9.21 a.m leaving many to wonder and speculate if he was returning to the scene of the crime to revel in his glory or his handiwork, or if he returned because he had realized that he left that knife sheath behind and he wanted to retrieve it. Brian's movements then show him driving back to Washington, getting a cup of coffee at Kate's Cup of Joe at 12.36 p.m., then going to Albertsons to purchase a few items at 12.46 p.m. Brian was on surveillance cameras walking into Kroger at 12.49 p.m. and leaving at 1.04 p.m. From there, there is no phone activity picked up again until 5.32 p.m. and 5.36 p.m. And this activity was on Johnson Road in Washington. Interestingly, the phone did not ping again in the Johnson Road area until 8.30 p.m. that evening. His car was not seen on any surveillance either, so it's unlikely that he just turned his phone off and went home since he lives near so many street cameras. So what was Brian doing in this extremely remote area for three hours? Did he purposefully turn off his phone yet again so that he couldn't be tracked doing something? Did he dispose of anything there after the murders and went to check back on it or maybe move something? 
Was he using this time frame to dispose of something or use whatever supplies he may have purchased at Albertsons earlier the afternoon? In Washington around 5.30 p.m. in November, it's completely dark outside. So do the police believe this is where he likely disposed or got rid of evidence, like the clothing he was wearing, the shoes, or the knife itself? And is this why this detail is included in the arrest warrant? Some experts have speculated on whether Brian wanted to get caught to show that he was smart enough to get away with it or wanted to get caught to indulge in his infamy. Trial attorney Mercedes Colwin appeared on the Dr. Phil show and said that Brian may have left a knife sheath at the scene to serve as a calling card, saying that the K-bar knife sheath found at the crime scene may have been intentionally left there, noting that the practice of leaving a personal mark after a murder was not uncommon with killers, adding that it certainly wouldn't be out of character for a killer to do this, especially if he thought he was smarter than everybody else. She also said that she is so sure that this was the case because the killer was so careful about covering their tracks, that it was out of character that they would have accidentally left behind the sheath to the murder weapon. But still, the question everybody was asking, what was the motive? An investigator familiar with the case, which some news outlets are saying that the source is actually a police source, spoke to People Magazine and said that Brian reached out to one of the four University of Idaho students over Instagram repeatedly in an attempt to get her attention, saying that he slid into one of the girl's DMs several times, but that she didn't respond. He basically would just say, hey, how are you? But he did it over and over and over again. The Instagram account was allegedly viewed by People Magazine prior to it having been taken down. It was said that this account of Brian's did in fact follow Maddie, Kaylee, and Zanna. It is unknown which student Brian sent those Instagram messages to. But could it be that Brian became so fixated on one of the girl's Instagram accounts, first admiring her in silence for a bit, then growing more confident, liking a few photos here and there? The confidence begins to boost and he starts becoming fixated on her now. In addition to liking the photos, he starts doing these weekly drive-bys of the house 12 times. He starts messaging one of them in October, but those messages go unanswered, which angers him. He sees that they're active on social media and still partying, but ignoring him, which possibly makes him feel rejected again, like his childhood, and possibly filled him with anger. Then does this escalate to planning out the attack to either punish them for not receiving his advances or out of just pure hatred? One of the many topics of conversation since Brian's arrest was that he is potentially an incel and displays characteristics in line with such. This has been widely discussed due to information that has slowly surfaced regarding Brian's childhood and even his young adult life regarding addiction, weight gain, weight loss, and bullying. FBI agents interviewed Brian's middle school crush in hopes of piecing together the psyche of this man that they believe committed these horrific murders. One former classmate, now 27-year-old Kim Kemley, was a classmate of Brian's in the sixth grade. Allegedly, Brian developed a crush on Kim and began romantically pursuing her. Kim's mom told the FBI that Brian was a then chubby, awkward misfit who became relentless in his pursuit of Kim, saying he would repeatedly leave love letters in her locker and tell her that he liked her and just always say, oh Kim, I think you are so very pretty and other odd comments. Kim would reply saying, oh my gosh, leave me alone. And her mom said that Kim didn't give Brian the time of day, but also said when kids are little, they're mean. They don't say, oh my gosh, thank you for the compliment, but no thank you, I'm not interested. They blow them off and brush them off. Eventually, Kim apparently told Brian to beat it and that she wasn't interested and it broke his heart. But even more concerning was the discovery of message board type posts from Brian when he was a child in an online forum website called Tapitalk. Brian made chilling online comments as a teenager, saying he had no emotion and felt little remorse for his actions. In 2011, he said he felt nothing when he looked at his family and that his mind was blank, saying, I feel like a sack of meat. And as I hug my family, I look into their faces, I see nothing. It's like I am looking at a video game, but less. He also talked about the neurological condition called visual snow, where vision is obscured by scattering dots. 
He said he saw himself as a sickly, tired, useless, and stupid man who was battling the constant thought of taking his own life and did not deserve to live. Saying nothing he does is enjoyable. He's blank. He has no opinion, no emotion. He has nothing. And then he asks people, can you relate? Former FBI investigator Pete Yachmitz believes that the brutality of the murders and Brian's history of social challenges may point to a possible motive. He said that he believes the continued stabbing of a victim indicates an uncomfortable rage and extreme anger. So what does this FBI investigator think the motive was? You guessed it, incel. He said, I think he may have developed an incel complex and that the murders may have been an effort to assert some type of dominance. On January 18th, 2023, the search warrant was released for the searches of Bryant's apartment in Washington, as well as his on-campus office. While nothing was reportedly discovered at Bryant's squeaky clean on-campus office, his personal residence painted a different picture. According to the search warrant, the Washington State University police seized nine possible hair strands and one possible animal hair strand. Authorities also recovered one nitrite-type black glove, one computer tower, as well as one collection of dark red spots and two cuttings from uncased pillows that had reddish and brown stains. These stains indicated possible blood stains, and these were sent to a lab for testing, which could all potentially link Brian Koberger to the crime scene. According to the New York Post, police also allegedly found shoes with diamond pattern soles matching the footprints that were found at the scene, as well as data compilations of information about the victims. This information, though, was not outlined in the search warrant seizure. Make no mistake about it. I believe Brian Koberger is guilty. I also want him to have a good defense team. And I want the prosecution to do their job effectively as well. I hope for all this so that in the end, there may be no question as to whether or not he committed these crimes. Personally, I don't think he'll make it to trial. I think Brian's going to take a plea deal at some point. Hey, I could be wrong, but that's just my opinion. But let's talk about the evidence Annie just went over and see how things might play out in the eyes of the devil's advocate if this case does go to trial. In order to better explain this part, I've brought on a great channel called Bad Things True Crime to give you a rundown on how efficient the current evidence is when it comes to a guilty verdict. Strange behavior, apparent DNA evidence, cell phone pings, accusations of stalking, and an eyewitness all point to Koberger being the killer of the Idaho Four. The legal principle of quote-unquote innocent until proven guilty means that a defendant in a criminal trial is presumed innocent until the prosecution presents enough evidence to prove that person's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. This principle is enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, which states that no one shall be quote-unquote deprived of life liberty, or property without due process of law. What if Brian Koberger is innocent besides the supposed damning evidence against him? Stranger things have happened in the American justice system. In 1994, prosecutors in the O.J. Simpson case thought they had a match-winning touchdown with the evidence they had against Simpson, and we all know how that turned out. Will Koberger have the same luck? Tracy Walder, a former CIA officer and FBI special agent, dissected the prosecution's evidence against Brian Koberger and searched for flaws in the affidavit. Walder discovered lines of evidence the defense might argue are insufficient to convict Koberger. The DNA evidence recovered at the crime site, inaccurate cellular tower data, and the eyewitness testimony. Today's video will look at this evidence and how it could get Koberger off or help him escape the death penalty. Since Koberger's arrest as a suspect in the killings of four University of Idaho students, several details about him have come to light. Investigators in the case published evidence from an official affidavit, stating that a location check of the 28-year-old's phone located him near the murder site hours after it occurred on November 13, 2022. According to Ben Levitan, a telecommunications specialist and former electrical engineer, cell phone data is insufficient evidence against a suspect. According to Levitan, this information provides an approximation of a person's whereabouts at the moment, but does not pinpoint them to a specific location. According to the affidavit, Koberger was close to the King Road residence at least 12 times before the murders. 
However, Levitan made it clear that this was not a guarantee, since the range of a cellular tower encompassed around 12 square miles. Furthermore, Moscow is a 3 by 5 mile town, and the tower could determine a person's whereabouts even if they were outside the city, thus not pinpointing an exact location. Levitan also highlighted that the mobile tower near the student's rental home collects data from a 27.3 square mile region. He stated, You cannot pinpoint a person. There's no chance any expert in the world can tell you where that person is located. The affidavit also states that detectives examined Koberger's phone records to see if he stalked any of the victims before allegedly killing them. However, Levitan noted that using this information to convict the defendant during court procedures successfully might backfire on investigators. They will be wrong and could damage their case, he asserted. Levitan noted that the official document suggested Koberger sought to quote-unquote conceal his location during the quadruple homicide, as his cell phone's location was not accessible from 2.47 a.m. to 4.48 a.m. Investigators suspected him of turning off the device or putting it into flight mode. Still, the experts said that it was not as simple as that. If someone's phone isn't showing up on the network, all it means is that they didn't receive any calls or texts or use any apps during that time period, he said. Levitan said that the investigators placed excessive emphasis on the phone data. He said the phone's location information was crucial in a case since it revealed who was not near the crime scene. Cell phone data records as evidence are very reliable and useful, but it's not DNA. It doesn't have the precision that would allow you to pinpoint a person's phone. The best the state can say is that this phone was in a 27 square mile area that includes the crime scene 12 times. People need to stop with the, do you even feel empathy for these victims? Does it matter if I do or don't? There's an innocent man who is being accused of something he didn't do. We need to wake up. DNA evidence is not accurate. Wake up! Gosh, you guys are being brainwashed. Brian Koberger, if you're reading this, we stand and support you. I love you so much. This Facebook user has popped up in defense and is apparently quote-unquote in love with Koberger. This strange trend of women falling in love with violent criminals is not new and does not make sense to the public. One part of her post stands out and is more understandable to those who follow true crime stories, DNA evidence is not accurate. What DNA evidence is there against Koberger, and how can the defense negate it? Tracy Walder, the former federal agent, said that the DNA evidence that led investigators to arrest Koberger for the deaths of the four Idaho students did not necessarily prove that he was present at the crime scene when the crimes occurred. Before he appeared in court, the police issued a shocking probable cause document detailing the evidence that led to his arrest. The police said in the affidavit that the DNA detected on a knife sheath from the crime scene tied Koberger to the killings. The knife used to kill four students is thought to be a K-bar-style fixed-blade knife that has not yet been located. On December 27, 2022, detectives stole garbage from the Koberger family's home in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, and obtained a DNA sample. The sample from his parents' residence were identical to those found at the crime scene. A DNA profile obtained from the trash and the DNA profile obtained from the sheath identified a male as not being excluded as the biological father of the suspect profile, said a later DNA study. It was stated in the affidavit that at least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. Investigators used Koberger's father's DNA to identify him as a suspect, as has been done in other cases by using a suspect's family members as a DNA reference. Reflecting on the affidavit's facts, Walder claimed that the DNA evidence did place Koberger at the murder scene, but he did not specify when he was there. The DNA is nice to have. It puts him at the scene of the crime, but it doesn't put him at the scene of the crime potentially on that day and around that time, she said while adding that this is a hole that can be poked in the prosecution's case. A former federal prosecutor has also said that the affidavit's evidence does not locate Koberger in that residence on the night of the killings. The prosecutor, Duncan Levin, said, What the evidence seems to show so far is that someone driving his model of car was near the scene, but no camera captured Koberger driving the car. 
Was the knife sheath placed at the crime scene to frame Koberger? According to the affidavit, the surviving housemate is the primary witness who saw the murder. Is one of the two roommates who were not hurt during the knife attack murders on November 13th, 2022. In the police affidavit, is referred to by her initials, DM. According to the document made public on January 5th, 2023, saw the murderer. However, 911 was not called until 11.58 a.m., hours later, according to the case webpage on the police website. According to the affidavit, froze before locking her bedroom door. The affidavit states that officials used observations to conclude that the killings happened between 4 and 4.25 a.m. According to an unnamed source, the eight-hour delay in reporting the crime has perplexed law enforcement officials in Idaho and has been something that we have puzzled over. We don't know if it was an issue of intoxication or of fear. <laughs> statement and actions may be what Koberger's defense needs to get him off. Excerpts from one lengthy Reddit post show how the defense might prove that this eyewitness account will not hold up as evidence with a jury. The post starts, quote, DM's story about her actions in the aftermath of the murders has sowed so much doubt in people's minds that it has me thinking it could be disastrous for the prosecution. It doesn't matter if you personally believe her. The fact that this many people heard her story and thought, she's not telling the whole truth, this doesn't add up, could mean a lot of people on the jury might reach the same conclusion." End quote. It continues, quote, Brian's lawyer just has to sow enough doubt in the minds of the jury for them to decide they can't convict him in good conscience, especially if the state pursues the death penalty. Brian's lawyer is undoubtedly going to question Dylan on how she could have possibly heard four of her roommates, two of them right across the hall, being brutally slain. She'll question DM on how sure she is that she can identify, one, a masked man who she saw, two, in a dark hallway, three, for only a few seconds in passing, four, while bleary-eyed from sleep, five, fuzzy-headed from drinking earlier that night, and six, addled enough to enter a quote-unquote frozen shock phase. Eyewitness testimonies are infamously unreliable, and the circumstances of her sighting make it even more so. The same Redditor brilliantly notes one other reason Koberger might escape the lethal injection. There's also a well-known phenomenon where juries these days harbor unrealistically high expectations for proof in trials due to people being exposed to so many police procedural TV shows that plant the idea in their heads that anything less than extremely damning direct evidence is insufficient. This is a case built on a pile of circumstantial evidence that's questionable enough to be inspiring half of the true crime community to spiral down various conspiracy theory rabbit holes. There are so many opportunities for Brian's defense to sow doubt in a jury, Dylan's story most of all. He could end up being acquitted after all, in my opinion. Is this enough for Koberger to walk free? Or does the prosecution have rock-solid evidence that Koberger killed the Idaho Four? So as you can see, there's a long way to go in this case. Guilty, not guilty, none of us are 100% certain. Again, we just haven't seen all the information. But if you're one of these people writing Brian love letters, that doesn't surprise me as much as it disgusts me. The same thing happened in the Ted Bundy case. And it was hella evident that he was guilty. Women were actually going to meet him in prison in order to, well, service his needs? Gross. Well, there's stupid people everywhere. These are the type of people that would drown themselves by holding a glass of liquid over their head because someone told them they can't breathe underwater. Let's just call them Darwinians. Sorry, Annie. Back to you. Speaking of data and digital evidence, there has been quite a bit of speculation about certain user profiles in one of the many online case discussion groups for the Idaho murders on Facebook. Papa Roger, the user profile on Facebook that has coincidentally vanished after Brian Koberger's arrest, has been debated online in depth about whether this person had inside knowledge or actually was Brian. And since the release of the arrest warrant on January 5th, there are now a few posts made by that Papa Roger account that many people argue are a little too coincidental for it to be made by somebody other than the person responsible for the homicides. On December 11th, 2022, Papa Rogers asks, how long do we think the killer was inside the house? 
A few days later, somebody replies and asks, well, how long do you think? Papa Roger replies back, very matter of fact, with 15 minutes, which we now know to be accurate based on the affidavit timeline. Papa Roger also accurately predicted the exact route that the Elantra was seen approaching the house, entering the house itself, through the sliding glass door, and fleeing the house, even mentioning specific roads, all aligning with details released in the arrest warrant. Papa Roger also correctly predicted on November 30th, 2022, that the killer left behind a knife sheath, a detail that was not made public until January 5th, 2023. And in another chilling detail, on December 22nd, 2022, Papa Roger shared his beliefs on where the location of the bodies were found, all of which were correct, including Ethan's body in the hallway, a detail that was not made public until February 2nd, 2023 over a month and a half later. The name of the Facebook account alone, Papa Roger, is a very odd name, right? So could this be a reference to infamous incel Elliot Roger? Elliot Roger was a 22-year-old who murdered six people and injured over a dozen before taking his own life back in 2014. His motive was simple. He was a misogynist who hated women and was frustrated by the lack of action in his own dating life. He was one of the most notorious incels, and unfortunately, his actions incited an incel rebellion, and there are some extremists that actually believe Elliot was a hero. For a while now, a lot of people have speculated that the person responsible for the senseless and tragic deaths of Ethan, Zana, Maddie, and Kaylee was in fact at the hands of an incel like Elliot Roger. So was the killer Papa Roger? Was Papa Roger in fact Brian Koberger? Interestingly, there has been an online campaign that is said to be created by incels to free Brian Koberger. Former FBI agent Stuart Kaplan believes that the death of the four University of Idaho students may be the result of suspect Brian Koberger feeling rejected. Another expert, retired FBI profiler Mary O'Toole, has stated that Brian Koberger was likely motivated by arousal and hatred and said that he would have been in a heightened state of arousal, and that means that he was emotionally aroused or even sexually aroused as he was killing those girls. And she suspects it was both, saying it was a very dark mindset. It's not highly impulsive. It's not reckless. It's, I hate this person. They have to die. Jonathan Gilliman, a former FBI special agent, added that the viciousness and the butchering made him think that more than likely Brian had committed violent crimes before the Idaho mass murder. He said he believes Brian has more than likely killed before, perhaps not four people, but that he thinks he has probably stalked and potentially killed females before. Both experts also shared that they believe the knife will be found. After Brian's arrest, it was also learned that Brian applied for an internship at the Pullman Police Department for fall of 2022 to help with rural police departments with how to better collect and analyze technological data in public safety operations. Many have wondered if this was to source potential targets or to get inside knowledge on how to cover up crimes. As evidence continues to be collected and requests for discovery are made, a detail regarding Brian's public defender was released that was very upsetting to many people. Public defender Ann Taylor had previously been assigned to represent Zana Kernodal's mom in unrelated possession charges, but she has since withdrawn from that case because she can't represent both defendants. Records have also showed that Ann Taylor may have represented Maddie Mogan's father, Ben Mogan, and his wife, Corey Hatrock, for some charges in the past as well. There are only 13 capital penalty approved public defenders and only one in the northern Idaho area, Ann Taylor. Would this potentially affect Ann Taylor's ability to properly represent Brian? Many are divided on the answer to this, while some legal analysis have stated that this is not a conflict of interest at all. News Nation had an interview with Kara Northington, Zana's mother, about how she felt with the news of her longtime public defender now totally gone from her case and now taking on the case of her daughter's alleged killer. She stated that she felt betrayed and confused as Ann Taylor currently holds power of attorney over Kara. 
On January 19, 2023, the Idaho judge over Brian's murder case put out a stricter gag order in place, which now includes attorneys for any interested party in this case, including attorneys representing the victim's families. Brian waived his right to a speedy preliminary hearing during his status hearing on January 12, 2023. He has not yet entered a plea and is waiting to learn whether prosecutors in the high-profile case will pursue the death penalty or not. The preliminary hearing is set for 9 a.m. on June 23, 2023, and is expected to last for five days. As the entire world stands by waiting for legal proceedings to resume, the public chatter and theorizing still remains at the forefront, because although there is a very strict gag order in place on this case, it hasn't stopped new information from surfacing. Kaylee Gonzalez, Maddie Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin were just setting out to begin their young adult lives, when a killer crept into their home in the depths of darkness and chose to take their lives into his own hands. And now their family, friends, and the entire world is patiently waiting for the justice system to take over, in hopes that these four young lives that were so harrowingly taken receive the justice and accountability that they deserve. It was a brutal, bloody, and senseless tragedy that unfolded in those early morning hours of November 13, 2023, in that King Road residence. A tragedy that will forever haunt family, friends, the public, and the university. And what truly went on inside those four walls? Still a mystery that we will only learn as more of this information surfaces as Brian Koberger potentially goes to trial. And I will keep you updated here all along the way as we learn more details, new information and documents are made public, and we will stay up to date following this case very closely. If you want to make sure not to miss any more of these videos or case updates, please make sure you take a quick moment here to hit that subscribe button below so that you don't miss out on any of those videos. So I'm Jake. I was Maddie's boyfriend. She brought me closer to Zana and Kaylee. Um, so I met Maddie her freshman year of college. We went to high school together, but I was a couple years older and uh, didn't really get to meet her until actually on her bid day of her freshman year. But I didn't really realize that I was in love with Maddie until um, the summer of 2020. She was the one who knew me best, and she saw me at my highs and my lows. Just helped me through everything. She was always there for me, pushing me to be better. And she was the person that I loved the most, and she loved me the most, too. Maddie has truly been a blessing in our lives. Maddie loved travel, especially with her best friend Kaylee and her family. They were both in love with life and exploring. That's why they hit it off so well. They were inseparable from the sixth grade on. They were truly sisters, and our families grew bigger and better from that. The world is a darker place without them, but the light of their, the light of their love and memories will always guide us all. Kaylee was our middle child out of five. He came across this. Going through Kaylee's stuff. It's called milk and honey. Most, most important is love like it's the only thing you know how. At the end of the day, all of this means nothing. This page, where we're sitting, your degree, your job, the money, nothing even matters except love and human connection. You, who you love and how deeply you love them Hi, I'm Jazzy and I'm Zana's sister. Zana was such a light in my life and so many others. She was a person I could relate to the most and she knew and understood me more than anyone. 
Losing her is the hardest thing I've ever had to go through and it has left me heartbroken. Xana was the funniest person I knew and made me laugh every time I spent time with her. Or I remember I would get so mad because I always thought my friends liked her more than me, but she was a person that everyone enjoyed being around. I remember her getting so mad at me for caring about the little things that didn't matter. She would always tell me she wouldn't know what to do without me, and now I have to live this life without her. Santa, you will not be forgotten. You have impacted so many lives and have given people so much love. I hope I can make you proud and try to leave an impact on this world and on people like you did. I love you so much, Santa, and I hope you're feeling the most happy, content, and loved in heaven right now. Hello, um, my name's Hunter Johnson. Uh, me and Ethan became best friends over the last uh, year and a half we spent at the U of I. And since we became such good friends, I feel honored and privileged to even be able to share who he was to everyone here. I met Ethan uh, during Fall Rush of last year. He was the first person I talked to during Rush that year, and I knew immediately that he was someone that I wanted to be friends with. He had such an infectious smile and a charismatic personality. And if you knew anything about Xana as well, they were very similar in how they acted together. Me and Ethan shared a lot of memories together. Um, I love you so much, E and Zan. Thank you.